<sighs> I'm so excited. I could scream. <laughs> oh, no need for that. I, I am both honored, but at the same time, I have a challenge. Because What's that? the challenge is that I don't really want to go. I mean, I, I understand that you can go really deep into your understanding of what's happening around in the sense of the world and universe. But I yeah. want to keep it somewhere where my listeners can also understand and make it practical and actually bring it to their life immediately. Okay, well, we'll do our best. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so carry on. Can I first ask you a very silly question? I promise you that it will be the last one. Are But, you enlightened? Well, uh, I'm not enlightened like a Buddha should be. Uh, maybe I have a little bit of understanding of uh, some of the Buddhist uh, teachings and the scientific teachings, especially. And uh, maybe I've had a little bit of experience of a few of the dimensions of reality that the Buddha discovered. But uh, I don't consider myself enlightened like a Buddha. I would never claim that. But uh, we're on the way. You know? We're working at it, as everyone should be. And um, I, th I found it very fruitful to do so over the last 50, 60 years. With the time, do you see that something is changing? I mean, it sounds like when we're talking about enlightenment, it's like in a very absolute state. But are there in-betweens, like layers where you can get on your path? Oh yeah, there are, very, there are definitely various stages. The Buddhist sciences, which are originally called inner sciences, uh, they have um, very elaborate and very carefully worked out phenomenologies, you could say, of uh, different kinds of higher awareness and different stages of reaching that and the methods of how to do so. They're, they are a professional, multi-thousand-year-old educational tradition that has real skill in helping people educate themselves to have a deeper understanding of the nature of the world and of themselves uh, being part of the world. And so um, I think that um, um, it's, a, it's unparalleled actually in the level of um, the, the whole huge literature, thousands of works that have been preserved from ancient India and are preserved in Tibet and um, And if you know some of them, I haven't read all of them by any means, but if you study them and then you experiment with yourself and your own mind, then uh, you definitely can make progress. And uh, I'm, both, I'm still working on it, but I don't claim full enlightenment, no. Okay, <laughs> I get it. As far as I understand, when you were 23, uh, you were invited or you were named or you became a monk. Uh, yeah. But then you actually left the monkhood. How the path of becoming a Buddha is also connected with being a father and being a husband. And you have such a big family of yours, a beautiful one. Can you please share a little bit how Buddhahood and the family are related? Maybe you have some vision for that. The Buddha famously left his family on his way to becoming a Buddha. And, uh, bec and the reason for doing that, of course, is that the path to a very higher awareness is very arduous. And um, the family life involves many distractions and many duties that are not necessarily enlightening. Uh, luckily, if you are a little bit enlightened or you try to combine being in the family with the quest of enlightenment, you can be a better member of the family. You can be a better father, better son, daughter, mother, uh, partner, whatever. And um, because it generally enlightenment goes in the direction of greater wisdom and greater compassion and friendliness and kindness. And therefore you'll be better in the lay world. However, uh, some, some people sometimes need to withdraw from the immediate interaction with people and, uh, and move into like a full-time training mode or education mode like people do when they go to school. You know, the, usually students don't marry until after they finish graduating. So similarly, uh, although the graduation when you become a Buddha 
or a high bodhisattva is quite a more extensive than they're just normal, um, you know, professional education. But nevertheless, you would withdraw from, from uh, maintaining a family. Usually you make it a family, in other words, after you finish your education. So in the case of the education for enlightenment, which could be lifelong or many lives long, uh, normally, um, some people withdraw for their whole life and then they become monks. In my case, I was be desperate to be a monk, some former life instinct, I think, because probably I've been a monk in previous lives. And uh, my old teacher, my original old teacher, uh, Geshe Wangyo, great Mongolian Lama that originally was what we call in Buddhism, my root teacher, he said, don't be a formal monk. You're living like a monk. You have already been living for a few years and you're studying all the time and you're not distracting with any kind of relationships and so on. But in the long run, as an American at this time in history, it's not your destiny to be a monk. And you won't be able, there's no institutions ready to really take care of you as a monk. And so you, you, know, you won't last. And I wouldn't listen. I was only 20 in my 20s and I was so determined. And so he said, well, you can try then, you know, and then he took me to India and then I was ordained. But then I disappointed my ordainers and um, returned to the lay life because there was no institution to support being a monk. And also personally in my own life trajectory, probably I needed to do a little more interfamily relating than I was aware of. And so I think I learned from that in my case. However, <clears throat> after I first did that, I got into an idea of what you find in quote unquote modern Buddhism, that maybe we don't need to be monks and maybe it's good to develop in the, in the lay uh, family setting. And uh, I got, and that's what a lot of Americans think who are ex monks. And I did too at first. And then I came to disagree with that. The monastic livelihood, vocation, institution is foundational and critically important for a society to become more educated and more tame. Uh, it is the counter in history to the military institution. And so everywhere, it's the only institution in history ever that got countries you know, kingdoms, societies to diminish the militarism that they all get addicted to. And it's sort of like an inner world mi militancy, which people become like a soldier. You're, you're, as I say, it's not like onward Christian soldiers. It's more like inward Buddhist soldiers. <laughs> you, in other words, you, the battle is within yourself to conquer your ego, your ignorance, your greed, your anger, your jealousy, all the inner mental addictions that cause our suffering. And, you, and as a full, like the commando of the practitioner is the monk or the nun. You know, that's like a special ops, you could say, in the inner military that is being a monk. And uh, therefore I consider it a very important institution and I try what little I can, given my circumstances, to support people who are monks and to support monasteries. And in fact, the great deficiency in modern Buddhism in the non-Asian countries, like in the West or in Russia or in America, is there's too few monks and there's too little attention paid to supporting monastic, the monastic environment. And uh, I consider it a really important thing, actually, even though I'm not a monk. I'm a failed monk. <laughs> there was, you want to be you want to be a monk yourself? Um, no, I want to be a family guy. But uh, oh, actually, see. my wife my wife wanted to be a nun. <laughs> when, oh, we matched, when, when we met, she didn't really intend to get into a relationship, but got decided otherwise, and we got a baby. <laughs> and it <laughs> just changed all the plans for her. <laughs> That's great! Congratulations! It's a boy or a girl? It's a girl. Her name is Taya. It's almost like one of your daughter's name, Taya. Okay. How old is she? Oh, she's three and a half. That's <sighs> another kind of meditation, but it's very worthwhile. The new young children who are being born on the planet in this era 
are very courageous bodhisattva-like beings because we're really messing with the planet. You know, the older generations are messing it up. And the climate uh, crisis is upon us and uh, too many wars and things. So the, the children who come from higher realms to be reborn on this planet at this time are definitely great heroes and heroines, in my opinion. <laughs> what other question do you have? I wanted to ask you about interrelatedness of things. I, I know that it can take long, long but maybe just as long as you, you, you have for me today. I wanted to look at this thing, at how everything is connected, me and you, and you and the world, and me and my, my child, and also the presidents of all the countries. Uh, in a scientific way, uh, the Buddha was the first person to discover relativity. What we call, you know, Einstein made famous, the word became famous from Einstein. But relativity means that all things are totally interrelated. And uh, in most world ideologies, people tend to get into the idea that there's some kind of absolute thing that is beyond relationship. And they associate it with God in monotheistic cultures. They associate it with um, emptiness or the absolute in, um, in the yogic cultures. And uh, they think that there's some absolute outside of the relativity and that, and therefore, if you can get to the absolute, then you're free of suffering and you're fine. So there is that tendency, but from the Buddhist uh, scientific, psychological, even physical point of view, that's a delusory effort in the sense that the absolute is empty of being any kind of thing that is separate from any, everything else that has relevance to the relative. That is to say, the absolute is all of this relativity. That was the Buddha's discovery. So we are totally all interrelated, although we have all our differences as well. And um, Buddhahood actually is defined as a being that comes to identify with all other beings. They feel, you know, apparently when you become a Buddha, Dimitri, you're going to feel that you are all the other beings simultaneously. You will experience that feeling, they say. So that means it's like a mother or you've been a father with your daughter. You must have had momentary experiences where you've almost felt like you were your daughter. You so much identified with her when you held her. You felt it was like you were both beings. You get this feeling. I think sometimes lovers get that feeling, sometimes uh, parents and children and so on. And what a Buddha is defined as is a being that feels that way about everyone. In a way you could say therefore it's like they're in love with everyone, they identify with everyone, which of course is inconceivable to us, how you could be like that. In other words, that you would really identify that you are these other people and therefore any suffering that they have is your burden. And you want to help them relieve that suffering. You have compassion for them and so on. So, so that's how Buddhahood is defined actually. And any degree of being able to have such an empathy for others is going in the direction therefore of Buddhahood. True empathy, meaning that you really practically feel their feelings yourself. It's like you become a, a, a cloud of sensitivity where you feel feelings of others in that say, who are in that cloud. And therefore, you automatically can't bear that they suffer. And, uh, and there are degrees of that. You know, even the ordinary person who doesn't think they're doing spiritual development, they don't think they're being Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or whatever it is, but they automatically still identify with their loved ones. And sometimes teammates in a team, people get like that even. It's not always necessarily familial. And, uh, and that's showing that if you magnify that to the extreme degree, then that's Buddhahood. Then that's to be a Buddha. They say a Buddha considers every sentient being like a mother considers her only beloved child, they say, which is inconceivable, right? That means a, a, a bird, a dog, a cat, uh, a cockroach even, you know, it's a, his, you feel that it's you, you know. So, so therefore, 
we are ordinary people in the sense that we more or less only identify with ourselves and maybe occasionally some extraordinary child or lover or something. But in, uh, on the other hand, if we use our imagination, we can, in the, there's an English um, saying, put yourself in the other person's shoes. So you can imaginatively imagine you are someone else who's suffering something and then feel genuinely sympathetic and even compassionate. You feel driven to try to help them free themselves from that suffering. And uh, that can help us in our relationships and our attitudes. And I actually think the only solution on the planet Earth today is to overcome the conflicts generated by the nation state, which the different nation states are, are like projections of the individual ego you know, like, I'm a Russian, I'm an American, I'm a Frenchman, I'm an English. And then the assertion of that, that expanded ego identity brings the people in the world into conflict with each other. And, or for example, in the context of the climate crisis, somebody in some country like China or America, they build more power plants with coal or they build, they burn more fossil fuels and they put pollution, uh, thermal pollution and carbon pollution in the air, which then blows in another country. And they say, well, I don't care about that country. Or they say, I'm not gonna restrain my own pollution of the planet because those people in that other country are not restraining theirs. So then they will add to it. So both in the context of the climate crisis and of course in the context of modern warfare, this, thing of oh i don't care about the people in that other nation i don't want i don't want them here I, they can't come be in my nation i don't want them i hate them i want to destroy them let's have a war uh, this we can't tolerate this anymore on this planet there's no room for it the technology is too powerful and the climate crisis is too huge and therefore it's it should be our duty as citizens to try to feel as if we are world citizens and to feel friendliness and to imagine that we did care like a mother to care about her child, about everybody. And for example, in Buddhism, there's a meditation where you meditate that every other living being has been your mother in a previous life because we've all had beginningless previous lives. There's no first beginning to life. That's a nonsense thing that Religions will tell you, even scientists will get into their big bang routine, but that's ridiculous actually. No, something can ever come from nothing and therefore there's no first beginning of the universe. The universe is eternal in the past, beginningless, and it goes on also endlessly. Although there are different people die and are reborn and different universe, you know, galaxies explode and stars explode and then new ones are formed. So it's a constant process, but um, it's a limitless process. So within that, therefore, I used to me meditate. I didn't like Dick Cheney. I didn't like the Bushes, you know, in America. I don't like Trump. I don't like a lot of you know, people who've been doing bad things against the country and bad things internationally. I don't like them. But I meditate that they are, they have been my mother and I feel sympathetic to them. And actually I realize that they cause these kind of trouble like invading another country and making a war or pressing some poor people in this country, locking them up or something. They do that because they themselves are so imbalanced and so frustrated and they feel such a strong internal stress and frustration they kind of have to try to dump it out on other people to distract themselves from how they don't feel that well themselves. And so I feel sympathetic for them. I don't hate them. I oppose them. I don't like their policies. I don't like their oppression and their killings and wars and things. I don't like it. Even their constant weaponry, you know, arming everything, selling weapons. You know, I don't like it. But I feel sympathetic to the people who are doing that anyway. And I should, we should try to do that, all of us. 
But that doesn't mean, because you're sympathetic to me, doesn't mean you don't oppose what they do that is negative. You know, people wrongly think that compassion and love and things mean that you're kind of namby-pamby, you become a martyr, let the bad guys get away with whatever and do whatever they want, etc., because that's so compassionate for them. So they wrongly think that compassion and this sort of thing is very weak. And it just allows you to be pushed around. But it doesn't, actually. Sometimes it's bad for other people to do bad things. And so it is good to oppose them doing it. But if you oppose them without fundamentally hating them, you know, disliking them to the degree where you'd like to destroy them and so on, then you can oppose them actually more effectively. You know, remember the great Asian martial arts tradition, you know, like Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Karate, Aikido, all those traditions. They all depend, the power of the masters of those traditions depends on not being angry and not hating your opponent. And the opponent attacks you and you just move out of the way, you, let, you turn their own aggressive force back against them you don't give in to them, but you also don't get all mad at them and try to destroy them. You just let, you let them find peace <laughs> by getting out of the way or moving them around or twisting them backward where their own aggression uh, backfires on them. And that's, but that's the only, that, that's the principle in life, actually. And that's what we call fierce compassion or tough love. You know, we have expressions like that. And that, and that can be good, too. So, um, so in our relations, we should tr strive for kindness, strive for a sense of um, being able to imagine the other person's point of view, strive for not reacting violently, even if oppressed, but, but sometimes maybe being a bit forceful, but only really mostly in defense, you know, mostly. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's the view, let's say, of relationality. The, be the, the dangerous thing in that is when people become fanatics and monotheists used to do that, but also materialists can do that. That is to say, they think that if I kill in the name of God or this or that kind of God, then since God is the absolute, then I won't have consequences to the killing. I'll be chosen by the absolute. So then they become fanatic. And then they don't relate to the beings, the other beings in a gentle manner because they think that it doesn't matter, just push them out of the way. And, and uh, there have been a number of books written criticizing the world religions for the Crusades and for Jihad and for all kind of violent religious extremism. And, but there also should be similar critique for materialists. Uh, who are anti-religious, but nevertheless, in the name of ideology, you know, whether it's communism or capitalism or libertarianism or some kind of ism, then they're willing to kill off other people because they somehow think that nothing is absolute. You know, that when you die, who cares after you're dead because you have no consciousness because they don't believe they exist consciousness or future life. And they, they think no matter how many evil things they do, just by dying, they get out into nothingness. Meanwhile, I have a news flash for those people. Nothing is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, there's no place for them to go except to become a continuity. And if you live violently and you harm other people, then you get, you know, lives by the sword, dies by the sword, you know, famous statement, you know, Western statement as well, same as the Buddhist statement. So that's what I have to say about relations. <sighs> they are better based on kindness, and we humans have that ability, and we should try it to whatever extent we can, and without being confused that being kind makes us weak. It actually makes us stronger. Hmm. I just remembered in one of your lectures, you said that once we were even blood cells in each other's blood. <laughs> yeah, once very we were likely. Killing each yeah. other and once we were making love to each other. Yes, once you adopt the infinite perspective, 
you know, the infinite, I call it the infinite lifestyle in one of my books, the endless, uh, you know, uh, infinite life book. Once you adopt that, you get rid of what I call the terminal perspective, which is the perspective that I only live in this life, so I want to get the most material pleasure I can out of it. And it doesn't matter ultimately what I do, because it's all ultimately nothing. So that's the terminal lifestyle, I call it. And um, you could have a theistic version of the terminal lifestyle. Well, it doesn't matter what I do because I know Jesus or I know Buddha or I know God or I know Krishna. And therefore, they'll save me no matter what I do. So they've got my final terminal is just being with God. But actually, there's no terminal. We're all going to be with each other. All the gods are with us all. They're all relative beings. There are gods. They're powerful beings, but they're not omnipotent from Buddha's point of view. Buddha talked to them, actually, and they used to consult the Buddha. Actually, the, the Indian god, who the other Indians thought was the creator, he asked Buddha to tell them that he wasn't the creator because he didn't like them thinking he was omnipotent creator. Brahma, his name was in, in Sanskrit. And the reason he said he didn't like it is he didn't mind when people were happy and then they, they, they sang the praises of the creator, you know, and worshipped him. He didn't mind that. But when horrible things happened to the people, he didn't like that they thought he did it. Because he's omnipotent. So he could have stopped it. So they, he didn't like that people would hate him when they would have a horrible holocaust or they'd all be killed or they'd lose their children or some really tremendous tragedy. Uh, then they blame the omnipotent God. So he said, please, the Buddha, please go tell them I'm not omnipotent. I didn't do it, whatever it is that causes them harm. You know, that's their own karma. We're all interactive. You know, some other people might have harmed them. You know, I don't harm people, he said. So tell them that. I'm, I'm a nice God. <laughs> that's in the Buddhist literature. What is actually real around us? I mean... I'm, everything. I'm... Everything is real. But there are different degrees of reality. You know, like there, some of them are what they say illusory. You know, they, they're, they're real, but they're not real in the, in the way that we think they're real. In other words, you know, we think, for example, that um, we have fixed identities, that I'm the real Bob Thurman. You think you're the real Dmitry Klopkov. You think so. And, and you, you're quite young, a lot younger than me, but even, you, even at your age, you have pictures of yourself in earlier times, you know, going on a picnic or going or whatever. When you were a little kid, your parents took some sort of picture. And, uh, and you say, oh, that's Dmitry Klopkov. And when you see in the picture, but actually everything about you has changed. But there's a continuity that goes there. That's it. That's it. We took from God. So the point is, you're real as a changing, living process. You can get better and worse depending on the circumstances and how you behave and what happens to you and how others treat you and so forth. So you're a living continuation you know, of uh, all kinds. Of, if you analyze yourself, you would come at all kinds of millions of little pieces little moments of memory, this and that. And in all of those little pieces, according to the Buddha's discovery, you would not find one unchanging thing that is the real Dmitry Klopkov. You would not find that. But in a way, when you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, you feel, this is the real me. <laughs> and, but you're only seeing a face. And, you're, and you know, it's changing all the time. So in a way, what you are is you have a kind of illusory type of reality. You know, it's like we live in a matrix. And in the matrix, we think with everything is really real. You know, my old Mongolian teacher actually used to say, try to keep it very simple and short for you. He used to say, people are not wrong that they are real. They are. The problem is people think they're really real. And then that's the problem. In other words, they absolutize their, the quality, the status of their reality to feel they're sort of more real than others. For example, 
you might think to me, I'm Dimitri, this, this is happening around me, I'm the center of this event. And each person in the, around, in the, in the room, they think they're the center. And the main thing that's happening is what's going on inside their mind and their experience. Meanwhile, if you take an angle from some other angle, the other people also equally real. So in other words, each one is only exaggerating the level of reality that they have. Everyone has an interconnected kind of reality that's always changing and there's always another aspect and another perspective. For example, you and I, we are, we are what is called, we have what's called Buddha nature. You know, we have a, we have a Tathagata Garba. We have a kind of Buddha soul, you could say, or a Buddha nature. At some super subtle level, we know everything. We're already Buddhas at some subtle level. But in a way, we really aren't because we don't know what we know, if you follow me. It's like we have a, there's a deeper awareness that we are distracted from all the time. And we sort of think we're like this and that, but the deep, more deeply, we're really something else. And um, in fact, if you think about it logically, there are many beings from the Buddhist point of view, there are many beings who have become Buddhas, right? Because of infinite past, in other worlds even. Then everyone who became a Buddha thinks they're everyone else. They experience themselves as being everyone else. Therefore, every being that ever was a Buddha thinks they're sitting here on the line here as Dmitry Klopkov and Bob Thurman talking to each other from Russia and the US. And we're having a chat. And everyone who was ever a Buddha is sitting here with us. And they think they're us. But they know that we don't know that they're us because we think we're something separate. And we're, I'm really Dimitri, I'm not, what do you mean? I'm not Buddha, I'm not an Indian, I'm not a, an alien from some other planet of Buddha. There's lots of planets in ancient Buddha, the very sci-fi world that they have. And I'm Bob German, I'm not this and that, I'm not Dimitri. So in other words, we identify ourselves in an unrealistic way, you could say. In what is really real is our deeper sort of Buddha nature. We're, we're made of this bliss energy of this enlightened energy that is Buddha. We're all made of that. It isn't that we have to go find it elsewhere. What we have to do is find out what we really are. And we get more and more real as we go. And apparently, if we really discover what, who we really are, we will be really happy. That's what they say. And we'll finally, finally we'll be Buddhas ourselves. And then that's a funny one. They say, when we're Buddhas, we know we're one with all the other Buddhas and also all the other non-Buddhas. So we feel one with everything. At the same time, as individuals, based on our whatever we have been in the past, we enjoy being one with everything in our own, each in our own individual way. So it's, a, it's which is again, contradictory, right? It's paradoxical. It's inconceivable. But that's what it is. That's the way reality is. Listen, you can sit and you can talk about eating an apple until you're blue in the face. You can write poems, you can write dictionaries, encyclopedias, chemical analyses. You can talk about everything involved with the process of eating an apple, a delicious, good apple. But none of them can match the experience of eating an apple. Eating an apple is somehow not capturable by whatever different angles of description and expression that you give to it. It's just eating it is just something amazing, you know. Being here, being here. so we're real, but we're not really real in our habitual way of thinking we're real, okay? So we're yes. a little bit illusory, but that's very good. It means we're very, the more we get to know that, the more we realize we're very changeable and once we realize we're very changeable, there's a sort of a little bit fear-based element where we don't want to change for the worse. So we take care, we guard against behaving badly, thinking badly, doing terrible, stupid things, and so on. And so we have a little bit fear-based thing. And then we have a, a hope-based thing, a really positive. We can change to become many different things. We can develop amazing abilities. 
We can have amazing experiences and understandings. We can create beautiful things. So we, we have a lot of energy toward going in the positive direction of positive change. Once we realize we're always changing, there's no escaping from the changing. Once we realize that. So the idea is, I have a slogan that I say, which is that when people ask me, what is Buddhism? And I say, Buddhism basically really is realism. It's being realistic. Because it, all Buddha was was a person who really did discover his own reality and the reality of everything and of the world. He really did. Because he, and, and then he, he gave the good news that the human being is intelligent enough if they're not brainwashed by some either political philosophy that suppresses their intelligence or a religious philosophy that suppresses their intelligence, tells them they're stupid or sinful, or this one tells them they're just a, 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 just a brain, you know, they don't have a mind, you know, the materialists do. And so if they're not brainwashed by that, they have the intelligence to understand themselves and the world and find their true reality. And when they do, they will find that reality is blissful and they'll be happy. It's an amazing scientific claim by the Buddha that, um, that people have been rediscovering for themselves over thousands of years since, but doesn't only mean Buddhists. Different people who are not even Buddhists have been discovering this. Because it, the Buddhism as religion is not the, exactly what it is. It's more an education system based on a scientific discovery of what is real versus what is less real versus what is totally unreal. There's different levels. You know. Okay? So that's, that's, yes. that's, both, that's both pretty simple and pretty thing. And I like to say a final thing, which is I'm especially happy to talk to you over there in Moskvá, which I've <laughs> been to a few times, which I like that. I, I love that. I love the Russian people. I really do. And um, I'm very frustrated because my original teacher was a Kalmyk you know, from Kalmykia. Yeah, yeah, of course. He, he had lived in Tibet for a long time. But he told me when he was older and when I finished, around the time I finished my degree in uh, to be a professor, he told me, well, when you were starting to get your professorship, your PhD, did you learn Russian? He says to me. I say, no, I, I didn't learn Russian. I was studying Sanskrit, Chinese, Japanese, Mongolian. Tibetan, you know, French and German, but nobody suggested it would be important to learn Russian for Buddhist Buddhology, you know, my field is Buddhology. And he said, oh, he said, you should have done that, he said. He said, when you're an old man, he said, when, if you can't teach Dharma in Russian, your work will not be finished and you will not be happy. <laughs> That's what he told me. And usually I get a translator when I go to Russia and give a talk. And uh, I'm still, I have a Russian grammar book and I'm still trying to study, but I get too distracted. You know? Maybe I can. You know, there was one Indian master named Shantarakshita in the 8th century who went to Tibet and was a teacher there. And they say at 80 years old, he learned to speak Tibetan fluently from having spoken, you know, Hindi, Hindi and Sanskrit and things like that. So, so I'm going to be 80 in uh, two years. And, um, and then maybe I will then be able to finally learn Russian and I'll visit you and we'll actually speak Russian, maybe. Otherwise, it's nice that you know English and we can talk. And uh, this idea that we have to be in any way, if I may, I may no one, I don't want anyone, leader of any kind of either side, to try to make the Russian people enemies of the American people or try to make the American people enemies of the Russian people, that would be very wrong. We're really very much friends and we should remain that way. We really should. We, we, along with everybody else too, but very <laughs> similar. We're very, very similar, you know. I really admire the, the little bit I've learned of Russian. It's very similar to Sanskrit. It has a wonderful complex grammar and it's very expressive. And I, I would really like to, to learn it, and I will try. I'll keep trying. Maybe I'll take fruit only in the next life, but I'll keep trying. Okay? So all yes. the best.
All the best to you. Bob, and Thank if you need you. a pen pal in Russian, I'm here for you always. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you okay, Dimitri. All the best. Take it easy.